and we're recording. It's all yours. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks, folks, for calling in this morning and uh, and listening in. Uh, Barb and I had discussions about this whole free service effort we've been doing the last few years, and one of the things that kind of came to mind is we've never really, in one call or or in one memo, put together sort of the big picture uh, of of the whole effort. And that's part of the goal today is is to explain some of the background as to uh, why we're doing this, and also to show some of the tools that many of us have already been using. Uh, so in, in some respects, this is a review, but we want to make sure to get everybody on the same page. So with that, we'll get rolling. If we go back to uh, 2007, the real instigator of, of this whole effort, which uh, even before DSS became a, a key focus in the agency, was a freeze we had in April 2007. And that caused about $2 billion in impacts uh, across the country, it's mainly areas uh, east of the Can front you range the and, and, the oh, yeah, and south of, uh, and I've just south sent you of the... Interstate 80. And uh, what happened is something uh, not too different from what we're seeing now. We had the second warmest March to date, and it advanced plant growth to a point of where uh, it was vulnerable to a freeze. And then we had a pretty substantial Arctic outbreak in early April with anywhere from one to three days of sub-freezing temperatures. This is pretty much across all of the southeastern United States. Uh, and there was damage reported over that entire area. The problem was that half of the area had no freeze warning uh, because if we think back to how things were done in this day, it was based more on calendar than on potential impacts. So after this report was issued, uh, Central Region issued a supplement and with regard to the freeze-frost season, it uh, set the standard that it's not based on the calendar but rather input from the partners and that this determination should be made each fall and spring because the nature of the weather and the activities going on uh, in vulnerable areas are really what uh, drive whether free services are necessary. So we thought, <clears throat> summarize who's impacted by freeze and frost events. And again, this is pretty much review uh, for the most part. Of course, agriculture, crop and livestock producers are, are one of the ones that are well known. But also uh, what might not be so well known or well advertised is the horticulture community. Uh, while they don't have the acreage in growing fruit and vegetables as say winter wheat or, or corn and soybeans, the value of the crops on a per acre basis is much higher uh, than it is on the agricultural side. And we saw, for example, in Missouri of that $2 billion, I think Missouri suffered about a fifth of the losses in 2007. And a lot of that came uh, from the wine growing industry. And then, of course, there's also the commercial and home gardeners, uh, which maybe some of us are a part of as well. Your nurseries, garden centers, big box stores, all those with stock uh, that are out. And what we've seen in recent years is actually uh, not only an increase in interest in gardening uh, throughout the area, but especially uh, looking at ways to extend the season in the fall and a lot more marketing of uh, garden materials and such in the fall than had been done in, in years past. So the question I think that bears asking is how do these folks mitigate freeze impacts? And with agriculture, especially with the large row crops, that's really a challenge because obviously they're not going to go out and cover their crops or anything like that. Probably their actions take place uh, a little bit farther out than our freeze warnings uh, are generally issued for. Uh, and there might be things depending on their situation and crop where they can market 
uh, do some marketing things to mitigate the uh, impacts of a potential freeze. Uh, but it should be known that if they are uh, hammered by a freeze, the replant costs are fairly substantial and you can run into issues of seed not being available and whatnot. And probably in central region, uh, the most area where this is most important is in the upper Mississippi River Valley and northern plains in the corn and soybean growing regions up there. Because the season is relatively shorter, they like to push the front end and they tend to be more vulnerable or more exposed to potential uh, spring freeze than areas farther to the south. Something that I think is not well known at all has to do with livestock and that is after a frost or a freeze, you don't even need freezing temperatures, but just frost that might damage the plant uh, somewhat, that, that disruption of cells in the plant causes the formation of a chemical called prussic acid and that's uh, poison to uh, livestock and horses as well and is usually uh, in sorghum related pastures primarily and uh, it can result in, in death to those animals if they're on that pasture after a frost or a freeze. So for those folks, while they can't do anything to protect the pasture, they certainly can do something to pull horses or livestock off of the pasture after a freeze so as to avoid uh, those sorts of impacts. On the horticultural side, there are a number of ways that are used practically. Uh, wind, fire, and water. Uh, wind, uh, we've seen here even in Iowa, there are uh, lower level wind generators and these are all focused primarily around radiational freezes at least that's the type of freeze that these sort of approaches work best for uh, so they can use wind turbines to mix the warmer air above the inversion down to the ground uh, they can use fire and what fire does uh, it's the radiational effects of the fire because smoke is transparent to uh, long wave radiation and, and not an issue. And also, especially strawberry growers, uh, as well as fruit tree growers can use water. And the idea there is if you keep adding water as it freezes, you release latent heat. So you keep the buds or the flowers right around 32 degrees. And even though the temperature can get colder, uh, because of that latent heat effect, you'll keep the uh, tender parts of the plants uh, right around freezing. And this gets into uh, whatever methods are used. In fact, for wind, they even schedule helicopters uh, to do mixing, to try to mix down the warm air aloft. It's not only how cold we're going to get, but there's a duration factor there too. And on the commercial and home gardener side, then we get more into the cover and, and bringing plant materials indoors, especially on the home side. Uh, commercial growers use uh, hoop houses in some cases to try and extend the gardening season. Uh, I know as farmers markets have become more important across the region, uh, there's also been a greater effort to extend the season longer into the fall uh, in order to increase profits. So one way I would recommend uh, folks are not already doing this, to get a sense of what's going on in your CWA, uh, probably the best contacts are your state and county cooperative extension agents. Uh, and they're associated with land grant universities and each state has one of these. Uh, they're the ones who work with these producers and are up up to the latest of what sorts of things are going on in the field and how sensitive they are. And in fact, uh, it's input from them that we use here uh, that primarily guides our season. In some states, uh, the state climatologist has, a, uh, has an interest in agriculture and can also be an excellent resource. And I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, individual farmers, growers, or ranchers, many of whom maybe you know th 
worked within the community can also be an excellent source for the ag and horticulture industries. On the commercial and home gardening side, uh, many states have a master gardener program. You might have some contacts there. They're, they're associated with, again, with the land grant universities and work at the county levels. And also certainly local observations, if there are any gardeners out there or contacts with gardeners, and just paying attention to what's going on with the nurseries and the big box stores when they begin to move stock uh, outdoors. Typically they tend to push the season both in the spring uh, and the fall because of course the longer they can stretch the season to market uh, the greater the profitability but there's a, a risk there and there are actions that they can take in light of uh, a freeze event. So with that I'm going to switch to Barb to talk about resources and services. Thanks, Ray. I'm here on audio and I'll change presenter to take control. And I want to make sure you're all seeing the same slide that Ray just showed. Yes, we do. Great. Okay. So now I'll move on to the next and start our talk about resources. Um, the first one I'm going to show is actually a, a rather newly developing resource that we've stumbled on this spring. The USA National Phenology Network is putting out daily images of the unusually early start to spring. This is the spring anomaly by estimating early leafing plants and uh, the red shaded map at the lower right shows that uh, early budding plants are emerging as much as a week to three weeks early, uh, getting up into our central region area of focus. Um, Excuse me, Bob. Yes? Yeah, could, could you uh, make that a little larger so we can see it better? Or, or, or did it, I just, it just didn't work on mine, maybe. I didn't know Am if I you Are you seeing a screen that has the actual presentation or the one that's a PowerPoint window with a background image? I'm just seeing the one with the PowerPoint with the uh, with images okay. on the left side. Okay, let me see if I can't change my screen then. Okay, thank you. Um, hold for just a moment. Okay, is this better? Should be just the uh, full screen? Yes, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, got it, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, this is a great product to look at a big picture view of monitoring where we might be at a risk uh, given early emergence of vegetation and looking at the potential for even timely freezes to cause damage. One of our main tools, though, is through the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, and uh, that is through their Vegetation Impact Program, or VIP, Frost Freeze Guidance. Many of us in Central Region are already logging onto this and using it, but we're going to touch on a few of the available resources that help us both get information about where we might be at risk for freeze damage and also uh, communicate that with uh, each other and with uh, any partners who are logging into the system too so that we can uh, be well coordinated in our efforts. So what you see here is the initial page for the Frost Freeze VIP program. Uh, and this is hosted by our partners at the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Um, it is meant to be a national tool, so while we focus a lot on Central Region, of course, these tools are available and are running for the full United States, uh, the CONUS at least. And a page perhaps that we're going to use the most would be this resources page by creating a login. Uh, somebody in your office already has a login if it's not you. We have the ability to update our neighbors on the status of our freeze and frost headlines. Uh, we can include some or all counties in each status, so this gives us an ability to uh, break our CWAs into uh, areas that are or are not susceptible because, of course, uh, freeze vulnerability doesn't follow our, our CWA boundaries and it is often the case that our northern reaches, for example, might not be vulnerable yet while our south is. You have the ability to say no, we are not expecting that freeze could cause damage yet or an absolute yes, we do think we're susceptible. There's also a maybe option in the middle. We might be susceptible to a harder freeze or some of our vegetation may be susceptible but not all of it yet. And that's where you can use the rationale notes to 
uh, to help give an indication of what it is in your CWA that might be vulnerable, if it, especially in that maybe category. Once you do that, this particular map gets updated, uh, usually within a few minutes of your input into the system. And this allows us the ability to coordinate across all of our boundaries to see where we are vulnerable or maybe or not vulnerable. Uh, the particular example I'm showing is from this past fall. And uh, you can see that there's a, a well-coordinated boundary between areas that had lost their vulnerability to freeze and areas that were still vulnerable in mid-October. Um, as we went into a freeze potential in uh, October, this is the watch warning advisory map on the same day. And I'm going to toggle back and forth between these a couple times to show that it was really a well-coordinated effort that we were using the input from the VIP page uh, to find where those boundaries were for the frost freeze headlines. Uh, sometimes these headlines were right across the middle of a county warning area. Whoops, toggled the wrong way. But uh, we are geographically consistent. We are consistent with the conditions that are currently being uh, experienced at this time, and we were consistent with each other. So that makes this a, a very happy map, and I think a, a great example of best practices of the VIP page being used to provide input to these frost and freeze headlines. And having worked that event myself, I can tell you, at least among our neighbors, we were using the input to that page and the messages that were being communicated uh, from our frost freeze program leaders in our offices and through the VIP page. So this is a really great pat on the back that the system's working really well for us. There are some other resources. Um, the next three slides actually are going to be different ways of looking at freeze date maps that are good for climatological reference. They may be good to post up on social media from time to time. So this map is the climatological date of the earliest freeze on record uh, in the 30-year period of record. And um, this might be a good example to show why um, even, uh, uh, even timely freezes can cause issues when there's already been some growth that emerged. Uh, we've had some of these areas, for example, in the south where we've had some frost or uh, some vegetation emergence. So if we did get that frost or freeze, even a, t a timely earliest frost or freeze in early March is likely to already cause damage in those areas. Um, and just a quick reminder that a climatological first freeze, mean freeze, or last freeze date um, is not really a great uh, decision basis for the frost freeze headlines, but it does help put it into context. Map here uh, includes our accumulated growing degree days since the most recent hard freeze, 28 degrees or colder. Uh, plants really care about these accumulated growing degree days. These are um, a good indicator of where emergence might be either imminent or occurring based on these accumulated growing degree days. Uh, I know some of you are going to ask about what threshold is the one that says yes or no things are emerging. Of course, the answer is going to be we don't know or it depends on what plant we're looking at and in what region. Um, in general, the trends of accumulation are the ones that are important, and you might be able to talk to specific growers in your area that do have an indication of what thresholds might be significant for you and for the crops or, or horticulture that matters the most in your CWA. And finally, this is another helpful way to visualize uh, potential risk or non-risk areas. The lowest minimum temperature since last August. Uh, just another way to include some input about where areas may have had some susceptibility to freeze if, for example, their lowest minimum temperatures have just not been getting all that low. And we're going to transition from there to services. And uh, again, mentioning back to late fall, I did show an example of uh, a freeze in, in mid-October, but by and large, there was a good part of the central United States uh, where the first freeze didn't occur until after the growing season had ended, which means that uh, there were parts of central region that issued no frost or freeze headlines in the fall, and, and that's okay. Um, if, if there isn't a growing season and there aren't any impacts, then there's no need for the freeze warning or frost advisories, um, And uh, which brings the uh, point that I've said before, and I'll, I'll reiterate for this. Uh, of all of the headlines and products that we issue, frost and freeze headlines, are the most impact-based thing that we issue because we only issue them when there's an impact. You know, we might issue a tornado warning even if we think that tornado might not actually hit anything, but we are only going to issue frost and freeze headlines when we anticipate there being an impact, which, which makes this pretty unique. 
uh, and here's another example of this uh, pattern that we saw in 2007 and uh, repeated in 2012, uh, maybe even repeating a little bit this year, and we'll have to keep an eye on it. And that is the spring of 2012. I'm sure uh, many people on this call can think back to how warm that spring was, especially in March. March was just by far a record warm month for a good part of the central United States, but it was the full January through March that ran warm, too. Um, and when you have uh, anomalous warmth in the late winter to spring, you get unusually high growing degree day accumulation unusually early. And uh, this example is for Mason City, Iowa, but you could have drawn this graph in a number of places in the north central United States where we were accumulating this warmth very early in March. And if you recall, timely freezes still occur in March to April across these regions, which means uh, the well here the climatological average the 50th percentile last freeze date at that particular site Mason City is May 1st so it doesn't have to be a late freeze for it to cause damage when there's already been such an accumulation of growing degree days ahead of it and uh, sure enough that's just what happened that spring these are the temperature traces from April 1st through April 30th and uh, Mason City went below freezing four times in April alone, including one substantial freeze, a very hard freeze in, in early April there. Uh, and, and this is the kind of freeze that causes damage. And in fact, there were billions of dollars of damage that year in uh, the Great Lakes, the parts of the Midwest, mainly to horticulture, but also to some other plants as well. And I, I hinted at this. Are we coming into this kind of spring again this year? Um, we're sure off to a, a warm ending to February, mid to late February. Uh, and temperature prognoses indicate that we'll probably return to a more near normal pattern in March. For parts of uh, the central region, particularly the southern parts of central region, it might be too late. It might be that we've already had enough emergence that freezes are going to be a problem. Uh, that is something that folks in those areas are probably checking with the growers to see if that's the case. Further north, say, you know, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, where we've had similar warmth, but uh, some some freezing temperatures mixed in there too. Uh, our risks might be lower, um, but it might set us up for tricks later if March ends up running warm after these next couple weeks of cold. So again, it's something we're going to need to keep an eye on here this spring that we may be setting ourselves up for early emergence in some parts of central region. Um, and it's something we'll want to be communicating with the growers to see if the plants got tricked or if they're back into hibernation once we get our cold snap starting later this week. I want to do a services reminder here that according to the central region supplement, we should only be issuing freeze warnings and not hard freeze warnings. And uh, what Ray and I recommend is just keeping it simple that we have the text available in the actual NPW and also in any decision support or social media that we put out uh, associated with a freeze headline to talk about those greater impacts. For example, when the temperatures are forecast to be in the hard freeze range, 28 degrees or colder, 25 degrees or colder. Um, and that, that we can talk about the duration too. You know, is this a night where we're gonna, you know, kiss 28 degrees for an hour or two, or are we talking about uh, 12 hour overnight lows below freezing and then it really becomes more of an impact for vegetation. Um, and just a reminder, um, if, if your office wants to deviate from uh, the directives, that's something that has to be negotiated through central region and up to the national level. So that's something we'd have to get in touch with you about and work with our central region managers and our, our headquarters contacts to happen. So um, for those offices that have not been doing this in the past, now is a great time to get that started. We spend a lot of time talking about freeze. Freeze really does have more impact in most uses and applications. For example, a lot of horticulture applications really don't care about frosts. It's the freezes that matter to them. But there are some applications where frosts are important too. And Ray gave a really good one uh, with the emerging research on uh, livestock grazing after after frost. So. Uh, just a reminder that if you're in frost freeze season, the freeze headlines do supersede the frost headlines. Um, also, if you are out of the frost freeze headline season, you can omit frost mention from your grids. For example, I'm guessing most of us are not putting frost in our grids just yet, um, except maybe in the far south parts of uh, the central region. As we emerge into uh, 
the freeze headlines being a, a risk or the potential for freeze damage being a risk, that's when we'll start to put frost in uh, our grids too. That's just a good rule of thumb. I don't think that's in a directive anywhere, but it's just a good way to sort of manage your, your grids and your weather mentions. And also, um, to keep in mind that when we say frost headline, we should be talking about actual frost formation, not just that the temperatures are some sort of near freezing but not quite freezing threshold, but that the conditions are being met that would favor uh, some kind of a frost deposition. Light winds, clear skies, your typical radiational cooling, you know, low enough moisture to get below freezing, but also enough moisture that there would be some kind of a deposition. So um, the freeze headline is pretty straightforward and temperature based once you've decided you're in the season where you'd be issuing them. Uh, frost headlines require more consideration of other weather conditions too, just to keep that in mind. And then um, when we're talking about ice, let's talk about fire. And uh, there are relationships and overlaps between uh, freeze and frost risks and the fire weather programs in your offices. For example, uh, spring green up, which uh, indicates an emerging freeze risk, also decreases the fire danger. Um, on the opposite side, as we get into fall, the freezes will kill the vegetation, which may ramp up the fire danger for those uh, shoulder season type fire seasons. So uh, it's good to keep track. You know, a lot of the partners who are keeping track of vegetation are doing it for both purposes. And uh, within your offices, it's good to keep track of uh, and stay in touch with your fire weather focal points to talk about when vegetation is going from brown to green or from green to brown to help you both do your services a little better for the partners that are in touch with us. I'm going to end this with plenty of time for questions, but before we get into those, um, I just want to mention a thank you to Ray Wolf because we're really lucky in Central Region that we have an ag meteorology expert among us. There are very few places, there are very few ag meteorology experts specifically, and especially in, in the weather service. So uh, Ray and I work hand in hand in these frost and freeze issues, and really he is uh, the expertise behind the frost freeze program. and put together much of this presentation for us. So I want to thank Ray specifically. We are both here and available to be resources for you. And if you do get questions or have questions down the line, I'd encourage you to email them to both of us. And uh, generally, if you don't, we probably talk to each other about it anyway, just because we want to make sure we're considering all facets of the issue and, and are on the same page. So when you have those frost and freeze headline questions, please feel free to email both me and Ray. And with that, I can turn it over for any questions. John? Okay, let's uh, check and see if we have any questions. Uh, you can either raise your hand or actually just type in a question if you like. So I'll give everybody a minute to, to do that if they choose to. Okay, I did see a question in here that uh, someone asked and then thought they got answered, but I'll just make sure I say it out loud. Uh, how do we handle the very late first freezes of fall that are so late that the growing season has ended? Um, and uh, as we alluded, yes, you can you can stop the headline program before you ever issue a headline. Um, some, they thought that perhaps that hadn't seemed to be an option in the past. It is certainly an option and remains an option that we just don't issue frost and freeze headlines in the fall if there's no impact to be had. I would uh, encourage you all to send out messages using social media, DSS packages, or any partnerships you have that indicate that you are done with the season so that you, you close it out and folks aren't expecting any kind of headlines. Any other questions for Barb or Ray? Okay, well, we'll 
turn it back. Uh, Barbara Ray, do you have... Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Aaron Johnson just uh, popped up. He's got a question, so let's go ahead and unmute Aaron. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Hi there. I assume you guys can hear me? Yes. Uh, very good presentation. Um, I know there's really not any magical formula with the growing degree days, but I've heard of several offices that using the the 28 degree threshold um, and the base of 50 degrees, something around 150. I don't know where that came from, but I've heard that um, from several offices that use that as some type of base criteria. So I'm just curious from Ray or or Barb where where that came from, or if that's just something that's rumor mill. Thanks. Yep. I think Aaron, the challenge with using growing degree days is you have different crops that have different growth thresholds, and I'll use three examples. Uh, peas don't grow much until the temperature gets above 40 degrees. Corn doesn't grow much until the temperature gets above 50 degrees, and cotton for our uh, Missouri folks there in the boot heel doesn't grow until you get above 60. So I think that the challenge is from a CWA perspective, there's no one number that fits all. But I think you can talk to some of your uh, extension contacts uh, or your state climatologist. I, I know for you, Aaron, Mary Knapp there at K-State would be a good contact because probably your main concern is going to be winter wheat. And uh, there are some tools I'm sure they have. Uh, as well as uh, USDA puts out weekly crop status reports once the growing season begins to wrap up. So, for example, you folks in the winter wheat region can see what sort of progress is going on there and what kind of vulnerability uh, will exist. Thank you. We had an FYI that I'll read off here. FYI, within RCWA, we continue to issue freeze warnings beyond the commercial growing season since so many people use swamp coolers for their homes and also due to extensive gardening. So you've, you've found a customer base and an impact uh, where it's still an important one in your CWA, and I think that's just fine. If you're still finding those impacts, logging them in the system, uh, in the MRCC VIP system, so that other folks know why you're still issuing those headlines too. And uh, I, I think that's good service. And that actually brings up a pretty interesting example, because if you think about especially in the fall from the home gardener perspective, if we put out a freeze warning and they take action, of course the action is taken to mitigate the impacts of the freeze so the gardens keep growing. And if they're successful, then that means when the next freeze comes along, uh, they're still uh, susceptible even though uh, we've had that first fall freeze. So uh, this is why I think being in contact with the users uh, is important and, and extension can be that conduit, uh, but I think one of the, the kind of generalized, uh, the overall goal of this whole process, and I think forecasters will appreciate, is we want to issue products that matter. Uh, and remember, this effort was actually started before the big push on, on DSS. And the other side of it is that uh, depending on, on your CWA, uh, there's a lot of big money. It's not just the home gardeners. Uh, there's a lot of big dollars involved and people do take action, an action that can involve a considerable expense, especially for the professional horticulture folks. So uh, I think the overall theme of the presentation today is that what we're doing with this program uh, does help people and does matter. I believe we have a question from uh, Jeff Colton. Go ahead, Jeff. I already addressed that one, John. That was the one. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we have another one here from, from uh, Goodland. Our customers in northwest Kansas have indicated they are only interested in hard freezes. How involved is the process to get exceptions from the CR directive? Does it take more than one WFO? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that there is not likely to be an exception um, 
certainly anytime soon, as we're looking to simplify our hazards, we're going in the opposite direction of adding headlines like the hard freeze and more in the direction of removing headlines. Um, but here is where your wording in the message and your package around that message is where you can communicate this is a freeze versus a hard freeze issue. Um, and uh, you know when it's when it's a, a minimal type of, of freeze warning, you can lay really low with it and and not place much emphasis on it. Where if you're looking at true hard freeze conditions, convey that within the text of the actual frost freeze uh, or the freeze warning, but also um, you know ramp it up as you would with any high impact weather event with your decision support and with your social media messaging. Um, you have a lot of opportunities within both the the product itself and the messaging around it to. Uh, indicate what type of hazard it really is. Is it a, a, a baseline freeze, an average freeze, if you will, or is it a hard freeze where there really could be uh, a higher impact? Ray, did you have anything to add to that? You no, know, I think the point about uh, simplification uh, and also the, uh, the continuity across CWAs is important too from the big picture messaging of an event. So I, I think it's important to have us all on the same page there. But you could liken that approach that Barb mentioned to what we do with the IBW tornado warnings, really. So that the uh, similar message goes out that's ramped according to the degree of potential impact. Okay, and any last minute questions? Okay, well, Barb and Ray, thank you very much for all your work with this and your presentation today. Thanks for the support, John. You're thank you, John. You and bet. A reminder to anybody who's listening to the recording of this, feel free to email your questions to us later. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.